Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan, and I am one of the authors of IPFS. And IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System. And we mean that. Uh, the quick story on the name is that back in the day, uh, JCR Licklider named the internet the Intergalactic Network. And the whole point was that with a network of networks uh, that was properly constructed, you could address any host anywhere, and it should be good enough to run for the, the entire galaxy. And that was the original vision of the, of the internet. And so the internet actually start, stands for the Intergalactic Network. So likewise, uh, the file system to go along with the intergalactic network should probably be the interplanetary file system. It could be the intergalactic file system, but planets matter. Uh, so the basic idea around IPFS is to try and get to construct a permanent web. And the big, a, a way to describe this idea is to say that content that we add to the, the web should remain there. Or at least we should have better guarantees about when content remains there and why it remains there and what are the semantics by which it might disappear. Uh, today, most of those semantics are usually just people being forgetful about URLs and changing them. And I kind of see that as a disaster. Uh, uh, the fact that you can do that is, is pretty screwed up, I think. Uh, this talk is titled The Mesh Web. Uh, because it's about how can we improve the web for meshes. Uh, we are here at Battle Mesh, so uh, it, it makes sense to talk about it in context of meshes. Uh, the structure of the stock is that I'll go over what is IPFS at first. This is, uh, still have to do a lot of that because a lot of people are not familiar with how it works. Uh, but I'll try to like lace through that because most people, uh, or at least a lot of people here already know it uh, and have seen or experienced similar things. So it's mo mostly about jogging your memory and telling you a little bit about the context of the problems that we're solving instead of uh, trying to explain everything from scratch. Uh, if you don't, if I go through fast, too fast through something, um, we can either address it at the end or we, if there's time, I doubt there will be. Uh, a lot of this stuff is already recorded and online. Uh, I've given a few talks, so uh, it's there. What is IPFS? And I'll do this in, in three layers. Uh, I found that this is kind of like the, uh, of course, the rule of three, but uh, three layers of understanding. Uh, the first one is like at a very super high level, what the hell is this about? Uh, I'll go a little bit deeper into why, uh, the, intuitive, uh, the intuitive way to think about the system, and then I'll, I'll give you very concrete definitions. Uh, from there, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about meshes. So I'll start with 2026. Uh, that is an important number, uh, or an important date. Because, as we know, Elon Musk has said that, we, that he will try to put a man on the moon, or a person on the moon, uh, not the moon, Mars. Uh, I'm thinking of JFK. Uh, so the goal is to try and get uh, somebody into to Mars by 2026, right? And they are very serious about it. So most people think they're going to fail, and it's never going to work. Uh, but they are certainly convinced that they are going to do it. And very realistically, uh, if, we, if a colony like this happens in 2026 or 10 years after, uh, they're going to need an internet that works, not just to send packets, but to actually use all of the facilities that we have come to expect from the network. Uh, it's not just about moving data, it's about moving our applications. Uh, when you think about people today and what they do day, day to day, is mostly mediated through software, uh, or at least a lot of people, and certainly in the, in the uh, I guess, mostly like high technology uh, areas of, of the world. So we, need, we have a deadline uh, of when we need to fix the web by, and that's uh, certainly 2026. I think we can do it much sooner than that. Uh, but to give you an impression of how far 2026 is, uh, here's to 2015, and 1991 was when the web uh, started, uh, we're over two-thirds of the way there. Uh, 2026 is very close. Uh, and in fact, Facebook and uh, Git started around uh, that point in the, uh, in the timeline, and that's where we are today. Uh, so yeah, uh, why, why planets and why uh, this stuff about space? 
uh, if, you, if you don't care about space and you only care about Earth, uh, the problems w that arise when you think about moving data as far as other planets, when the, where the latency is absurdly uh, high, is very similar to moving data to mobile devices, or in this case, meshes, uh, where you want to minimize the round trips that you take. You want to minimize um, how, many, how much content you move back and forth. Certainly, if you're moving the same content, you're probably doing something wrong. And guess what? Most of the network is doing something wrong. Uh, and so this, this metaphor of saying, how can we construct a file system for, that should work across planets uh, makes sense uh, today. And how do we make a file system uh, to operate uh, in the very heterogeneous uh, kind of network that we have? We don't have a network that is, is you know, all fast links. In fact, we have very, very slow pipes uh, in between and uh, different kinds of networks with different properties that most people building websites i.e. applications that everybody uses and depends on, uh, don't really think about or consider. And that's a, a pretty big problem. Um, it's funny, like in the last few days with like little internet connectivity, like I feel very weird. Uh, I don't know if it's just me or any, anybody else, but like I haven't had the, the typical dosages of bandwidth recently or latency, and uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, and so it, it makes me think like if, when I have a network that at least has some connectivity, even if it has a bunch of packet loss, why is it that most of the applications that I use completely f fall apart and I can't use anything? And it's 2015 now. We really shouldn't be do, uh, doing this right now. Like We should have fixed all of these problems by now. And this is a, a strong push to come up with the right abstractions and implementations of protocols uh, that can get us there. Uh, the web, uh, so why do, I talk, why do I talk about the web and not just the internet, right? Like we, we love thinking about networks and moving around packets and the web really has very little to do with meshes, right? I mean, the web is like layer a million, right? Like what, what is that? Like we're talking about like what, like JavaScript and like CSS, like what is that? Like that doesn't have anything to do with low level packets, right? Well, when you think about what people do day to day, most of their traffic goes through the web. Like most of what people do day to day is open a web browser, go to some application, and do something. And to some extent, mobile applications have taken a lot of that traffic. Um, but even they uh, are still moving most of the, of the data with websites or doing most of, the, of their work through web, uh, like RESTful interfaces and that kind of stuff. So it really matters. Like the, the way in which we structure our uh, usage of the web uh, has to make sense with how the network um, is structured. And when those two things don't mesh well, uh, that's why uh, you, you see all these like, huge failures of, of connectivity or, or failures of, of being able to use something even though you have spotty connectivity. Uh, I, it's kind of crazy how like, TCP, TCP flows just totally fail when <laughs> you have you know, a certain percentage of packet loss and uh, things get really borked in most applications that you would use. And all of the timers that people have put in there expecting certain things to resolve at certain times are just suddenly all wrong. And tons of applications just give up because they think that they can't uh, work at all uh, when they, in fact they should be. And it's kind of crazy because um, well, I'll get that in, in, into that in a second. So this is a an old, old image. This comes from Paul uh, Baran, who, uh, or Paul Baran, still haven't figured out how to pronounce his name. Uh, he is the guy who invented packet switching. And in his original characterization of networks, he divided them into three kinds. There's centralized networks, there's decentralized networks, and there's distributed networks. And the fundamental difference between these is that uh, in the centralized decentralized case, uh, you have certain nodes that are more important than the others in that they are doing something different. They have different code. Uh, that kind of architecture made a lot of sense when one network operator was running the whole thing, uh, but doesn't really make sense when you think about the internet. Uh, that's why the internet was designed so that you could have this huge distributed mesh and not wireless mesh, but it was still kind of a mesh. Uh, and nodes would just work and you could cut the network in half and it would still work and it could come back together and everything was nice, 
And that was, that's the whole idea behind being, making um, the original ARPANET. And the problem is that today, the, the web started over here in the decentralized, uh, sorry, in the distributed, totally distributed sense where, um, you know, Tim created these, the, the uh, HTTP client and servers and uh, he and other people uh, created this, the client and servers and the whole point was that you would have both a client and a server in your machine and you would publish some content and you would uh, pull down some content, and it was kind of uh, similar to FTP in a way, so it was supposed to replace uh, people's usage of FTP and other protocols like that. Um, and they followed on with that model, but the whole point was that people should be publishing and consuming content simultaneously. Uh, and it had this notion of uh, a full mesh. You had clients uh, talking to each other and so on or you know, client servers, the, mod the model existed, but it was not supposed to be um, the fundamental you know, end. Uh, the goal was to, to empower any host in the network to just publish data and make it as easily available as possible. Uh, but what happened over time is that we're now here, where we have one centralized location for a website, and mostly everybody accesses the web through thin browsers that don't do anything except request stuff. Uh, publishing anything requires sending data all the way into the backbone and then uh, doing operations this way. And it's kind of crazy because uh, when you think about how important some of these applications are and you start thinking about how much you depend on links existing between you and specific servers out there in the network and when people might cut off those links, what happens to you? I mean, what, what if this is a permanent cutoff, right? And so this is something that most people don't think about when they use the internet, uh, certainly don't expect it. I feel the majority of people that use the internet would kind of be very worried if they th realize that this is how the web actually works. Uh, so let's bring it back, right? Like, let's take the web and dial it all the way back to distributed. Uh, why is it that... Um, the web, though it was designed to be distributed, got centralized. There's a lot of um, pressures towards that, but there's some fundamental protocol problems, actually. So it's not just a, a uh, I think like most people like to say, well, it's all political. There's like huge corporations that drive everyone to, to just centralize and so on, and they control uh, the browsers and so on. But regardless, there is, um, there is a, a, uh, a set of issues with how the protocols are structured that makes, makes it extremely difficult for the distributed case to work on the web. And so IPFS is about fixing those uh, and making things really, really fast, uh, making things secure in a different way. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that. And try to go back to the original vision for the internet, which was it shouldn't have any head. You should be able to cut it apart and put it back together, and everything should still work. Uh, you should be able to have public and private parts of it, and all, all, all that should mesh really well and nicely with each other. And your content or your data shouldn't be locked into specific physical locations in the world. Like, how did we, how did we so irresponsibly get to that? Like, that's absurd to me. Um, and it's only like really uh, intense. Uh, like really big companies are the only ones that really replicate their data across the world uh, and actually protect it from, from natural disasters. So right now we're living in this weird situation where if a select set of, city, of specific data centers were to go away through some natural disaster or you know, strikes or whatever, um, we'd be in deep shit. So let's fix that. The internet is beautiful. Uh, and part of what made it work was this nice layering, right? This is internet 101. Uh, let's write protocols in this nice layering so that you can stack them and you can use fiber and um, ethernet and IP and then talk over TCP to move around some FTP content. Or use Skype and probably some UDP traffic still over IP and go talk to Wi-Fi over some radio, uh, and even pigeons, of course. Uh, the beautiful hourglass model actually can come back and save us uh, from, the from the problem that we have today. Uh, and I'll 
discuss how. But uh, one of the important point to to mention is that all of these protocols, what's beautiful about the internet networking and so on, and I think all of you here uh, know this, but what's amazing is that you can just come up with a better idea and just publish it, implement it, and if it's actually better, people will switch. And so we're, we're in the, we've described it, we've implemented it, we're like in the edges of that, we're like coming out, and now people are using it, so that's cool. Uh, and so eventually we'll, we'll go through the process of like building our, making RFCs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we do have specs, so if you want to make an implementation, you can. It's a little rough and you have to talk to us because it's big. Uh, we never expected it to get so big, but um, there is uh, a problem, which is that the peer-to-peer -peer stack, like the peer-to-peer -peer network stack looks actually a little bit different from the traditional stack that we think about for the web. Like if you want to move around and address content, if you want to move around and address flows between peers, um, the, the whole web is like using the traditional stack and not thinking about how to find uh, peers. Like NAD and so on are all special cases of this fundamental problem that uh, when you do peer-to-peer -peer in the application space uh, and all you get is to ship a binary and you have no ability to talk to the OS or like no ability to think about how to set up the network. You have no idea what, you know, you, you can't touch DHCP, you can't assign addresses and so on. Uh, you basically have to reinvent everything from scratch. And this happened to Skype. They did a very, very small amount of it. Um, I mean, actually, they did it a lot, but, uh, but they didn't go, you know, into creating a whole new stack and like publish it with RSAs. Uh, they just kind of solved the problem they had to solve and moved on. Um, and we, in the process of, of building all of this, we realized how big this dragon scave is, and we've been like in there for months, and we've seen some stuff, and we've like found ways uh, to think about these problems and layerings of the protocols that make sense uh, to how to do content in a distributed distributed sense. All right, so uh, just to bring back the importance of the web. Uh, Nowadays, at least certainly, uh, I'm from Palo Alto, so there, uh, most people operate their day-to-day -day life uh, completely dependent on software. Uh, I mean, if you take away software one day and the internet one day, like, people would not know what to do uh, at all. Um, it's, it's kind of absurd how much of people's communications and work is piped through uh, their web browser. Um, and I mean, on the one hand, it's amazingly beautiful and powerful because that means that you can then take and replicate all that power and sh move it anywhere in the world, right? Like the world of bits is awesome. You can just move these capabilities and give them to people. Like you come up with a way of like doing better education, boom, make a website, ship it, and now anyone in the world, if they have, you know, if they have a connection, if they have good bandwidth and not so terrible latency, and they have you know, some amount of access, can now have that capability. And that's really powerful, uh, but it's also kind of dangerous because if we don't think carefully about how we protect those semantics of access and those semantics around uh, what it means to, to have an application on the, living on the network, um, we can end up with disasters where people can block off access for whole sets of people um, or uh, just taking out just specific select applications and blocking them from, from some uh, from some places, right? So the the like glorious revolution that has been the internet of trying to uh, democratize access to information and, and all these amazing powers that we get. Um, you know, think about Wikipedia and how useful it is and how useful it would be if everybody in the planet could access it easily. Like the, the reality is, they can't. I mean, we're told they, that you know, certainly by now, certainly by 2015, everyone in the world would be connected and everyone would be have a really fast pipe to the network. Uh, but that's not true. So, uh, and, and sadly, I think it's it's not a hardware problem; it's a software problem. Uh, so we just have to make better protocols. Cool. I'll, I'll just walk through some of the problems. I think most of you here already understand these issues. So. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give it some weight because these are serious things. Uh, traditional problem of bandwidth, everyone knows it. You have one big source of data and a bunch of people in one room. If I send you Gangnam Style and you start watching it all at the same time, we're going to host the network uh, by pulling it down a bunch of times. And it has been served over 2.3 billion times. 
So if you say you, you got the, like, you get like the 200, 200 megabyte um, like version of the video, that's, if my math isn't completely, totally stupid, um, that's 477 petabytes, which is absurd. Uh, I almost have to like do it again. Um, that's a lot of data uh, when you think about just one video shipping to usually the same places, right? Like it, this doesn't mean that 2.3 billion people have seen it. Um, at least I don't think it does. I think it's, there's a lot of repeats there. Uh, another related problem is the offline case. So what happens when we're all using an application and it's supposed to be uh, collaborative or whatever and suddenly the network fails and we no longer can talk to the backbone? We are sitting here in a room with a whole bunch of applications that should talk to each other but don't. And it's not because they can't. I mean, the, the, you can ping each other for sure. Uh, and you can probably have applications that are native that talk peer to peer, but it's actually extremely difficult to get that kind of, of, um, of system working in a browser, whereas where most applications are today. And the kind of tragic thing is that, so I went through a whole bunch of applications and, and tested all of them to see which ones had like an even competent like uh, offline use case. And I was sad to see that n like none of them worked well. And included in that is a whole bunch of messengers that people depend on. Like this is how people talk to their loved ones. This is how people like organize if there's some like natural disaster. This is the lifeline they have to everything they know and love. And if you take it away like suddenly, um, even if you have a bunch of infrastructure there in place, a, a whole bunch of meshes, things just don't work. And that's like an issue. Uh, we have this coming, which is a whole bunch of devices that are very different, uh, and they have to move content to each other, and right now it's all happening through like ad hoc proprietary protocols or being shipped through the cloud, uh, which is annoying. You know about that, you know about this, uh, when suddenly you get like surprise oppression and uh, you have to uh, then deal with the fact that like you have to pop up meshes really quickly to try and get another uh, uplink really fast. But what if you didn't need an uplink? What if you could just communicate without, uh, as long as you, could, you had radio, right? Like that's the, that's the beauty of mesh networks. That's the beauty of being able to have like wireless, wireless links between people in cities. Uh, and yet, the applications are not built for it. Uh, the problem of book burning uh, is, you know, we've, throughout history we've kind of said like book burning is one of the worst things that anybody could possibly do. And yet today, we just do it all over the web all the time. We kill links, we uh, change URLs, we do all this sort of stuff. People can find stuff. And you have to hope that people remember enough of the search string to be able to query it and so on. But applications are dead in the water. Like, applications don't run a search to, to try and find stuff. Usually they don't. That's kind of slow. Um, so anyway, that's, so those are like the dire problems with the web and how, why it doesn't work with the real network that we have, uh, and IPFS is a way to upgrade the web. Uh, it's thinking carefully about the web stack and improving it and uh, impl implementing a set of, of, um, of protocols uh, and showing like a proof of concept and beyond a proof of concept actually a thing working and beyond a thing working actually shipping it to people's, people to use it. And so that's where, where we are. Uh, we want to make, in short, we have want to make the web distributed, work offline, uh, for some definition of offline, uh, permanent, and that means content should be addressed permanently. Some content, like, it is impossible to guarantee the existence of some bit string without constantly putting uh, energy into that. Uh, but at least we can come up with protocols that can help get us there. Uh, we want to make it smarter about how it moves around content. We want to make it safer. Uh, think about security in a different way instead of armoring the wire. So this is uh, Van Jacobson who's been doing NDN, which is very similar uh, to our goals, uh, but just at a different layer of the stack. Uh, think, talks about how instead of armoring the wire, we should be armoring the content uh, instead. And that's a much safer notion of, of moving around important data, right? Like. Uh, who cares if somebody can go and like break a TLS cert if you can just check the content and make sure that it's assigned by the correct people. Um, and where we started actually, like we, we didn't start with all of this, we started with just wanting to make it faster. Uh, I was really frustrated and annoyed that uh, I, was, <laughs> I was with a friend and I was trying to teach her about um, 
doing uh, like AI, uh, actually machine learning, uh, visual, uh, we're using convolutional networks to try and, and do like some vision uh, stuff, right? Like to try and like recogni object recognition stuff. And all of the data sets for that are online and they're all in a bunch of FTP servers and HTTP servers. And <laughs> downloading the stuff was hard. Some web servers were totally gone. Content moved, content changed. Suddenly, like one data set, we couldn't replicate results. And why? <laughs> the data set had changed. And people hadn't noted, noted that. Uh, so if, like, what is happening? Or like, how, how are we allowing this to happen? Um, and so we, this whole thing started with just wanting to make it faster for moving around data sets. All right, that's probably like the longest section. Uh, more intuitively, like forgetting about all the heavy weight stuff, the web is just links, right? We, we have content and we link it together. And we have media, meaning we have applications and so on. Let's just take the hypermedia transfer protocol. Uh, let's make a hypermedia transfer protocol that understands how the stack works today. And we draw ideas from SFS, Git, BitTorrent, DHTs, and a whole bunch of other protocols. Um, but these are probably the main inspirations. And so that's what IPFS is. It's like saying, let's take a bunch of really good ideas that we've learned since the web started and try to imbue the web with those powers. And um, that actually, oh, I think I blew out a section. Eh, doesn't matter. So the, the intuitive notion of, how, of what IPFS is, if you've ever seen Git or ever used Git, Git works with a, a Merkle tree underneath the hood. That's the core data structure of Git. A whole bunch of other systems use it, things like Bitcoin, like the blockchain is a, is a Merkle tree. Um, I think, Bitor yeah, BitTorrent uh, torrents are also a Merkle tree. We know them, they're amazing. It's just a very simple idea. When you address content by, by their hash, uh, you can create immutable data structures where you're just adding stuff uh, and you're pushing it up. So in the regular world of Git and all these other systems, you have one Merkle tree that you're working with and you design it ad hoc for that case and that's it. Uh, and you have all these different systems with different kinds of trees. Some of them are the same. You have many different Git repositories. Um, but what if like, they were all in a big forest? Like, what if you had one transport protocol for all the Merkle trees, and you could design your own Merkle tree however you wanted to, uh, and your own data structure however you wanted to, and you were using the same transport for moving it around? And so that's the, the hourglass here. Like, it turns out, think about distributed data, um, when you're thinking about modeling data structures that can be mutated and changed um, over long distances, uh, if you structure things in an append-only log style, a whole bunch of problems just disappear. You don't have to think about uh, looking at content, uh, trying to like pull if that content has changed. You just know that the content has not changed uh, from like the definition of the of the system. Uh, in the world of in, in the forest of Merkle trees. Uh, Here's like an example of like the Bitcoin blockchain would look like, just a really tall Merkle tree. Um, cool. That's intuitively what IPFS is. It's just like a huge transport for Merkle trees. Uh, and we have a protocol stack. Uh, we have tools and programs that, that implement it. We are, so we have a pretty large community at this point, and we are making tons of programs. And we try and make everything modular and small, and we're just publishing all of that. Uh, as, quickly as we can. And so we have even simple things like people can now press some keys on their computer, take a screenshot, and it immediately publishes to IPFS, copies a link to your clipboard, and you're now like serving it with that so that if people, if you post a link somewhere, uh, it'll render in the regular web, and you can paste a link to somebody else. So we're like just encounter, like making, as we're building and using uh, IPFS, it's just seeping into all of the things that we do, and we're just making a whole bunch of systems around it. Uh, and there's like the, the core uh, implementation, which is right now written in Go. Uh, and we have, and IPFS is also a live system. It is a network that is living and people are part of. And it's actually, I think, a, f a couple of different networks out there uh, that, that are not merged. Uh, they can merge, so it is designed, the whole thing is designed so that you can take two networks and, and put them together and all the content is still the same. Or you can uh, route everything and everything works. Um, but that's kind of how, how it, it works. So um, the IPFS stack is this layering of, of protocols, uh, or not necessarily the protocols, but rather like uh, they're, they're distinct 
uh, areas of, of there are different parts of what everyone has to do when they want to publish content on the internet. And most of the time, you don't have to think about it because your host network stack takes care of it, or the regular HTTP world takes care of it. But when you want to do things peer to peer, everything has to change. Um, and that's kind of annoying, and that's why it hasn't really happened up until now. Uh, but if you make things layered uh, and structure it well, then you can actually build something that works. You can take all these pieces, and if you design them carefully, keeping in mind the original intent of the internet to layer everything correctly, uh, then people can actually use all these underlying layers without using everything. Um, and so when we have our, our stack, which is kind of divided into three parts, there's uh, using the data at the top, there's just applications. We are targeting existing applications, so we want almost zero, if any, change whatsoever to current applications. Um, we have the part of defining the data, and that's the uh, Merkle tree transport. And we have moving the data, which is the traditionally uh, really hard part of peer-to-peer, -peer, which is how do you get a point-to-point -point network to behave like a, uh, you know, that's behind NAT, and that's behind um, totally heterogeneous networks where links are very different, and how you get a network like that to self-organize and move around content efficiently and effectively. Uh, you, you have problems of discovery, you have problems of routing for peers, you have problems of routing for content, you have problems of, of um, actually moving data. What if the data is big? What if the data is small? Uh, what can you get away with? Like, what can you store in different nodes? Like, for example, my phone, ooh, a lot of tweets. Um, if my phone is part of a DHT, that probably doesn't make very much sense, right? Like if it's totally going in and out. Um, so those kind, solving those kinds of problems, usually most protocols out there just give you like a, a very simple solution, say like this is how you want to do a DHT, this is how you want to do whatever system, and like deploy the same in all your nodes, and they don't account for the fact that like <laughs> the network is very, very, very different, and you'll have nodes that um, are pushing, they have different roles in the system. Um, so we're making this huge bag of like protocols that all are meant to work together, and we're calling that libp2p. And we will be uh, shipping out that, all of that as like a bundle with different implementations in Go and JavaScript first, and a whole bunch of other stuff later. Um, and you can take pieces of that and say like, oh, I just really need like a discovery protocol for like local area networks uh, versus I want a full NAT hole punching stuff uh, or I want uh, I have all of that solved. I have my own overlay network, and I want to make sure that content is moving around effectively uh, and routing for content is fast and so on. So that's exciting. Uh, people will be able to use a lot of that. And the, the crux of the whole thing, like I said, like the heart of IPFS is the, that Merkle tree, Merkle DAG uh, area. And I'm like tentatively naming this IPLD, uh, which is, stands for Interplanetary Linked Data. Uh, I had a very crazy moment uh, a few days ago, or like a few weeks ago, uh, where I kind of like realized that if you, because all of this data is linked, right? Like the entire web is already linked data. Um, not like the nice kind in that like you, you can reason about the data, um, but it's, it's already links. What if we had linked data that worked in a distributed web where you didn't have to like phone every single server, right? Like today, the way that most linked data systems work is that you have like a whole bunch of definitions and you have to like constantly query other servers to make sure that like definitions are still the same and so on. And like that that is one of the one of the many reasons that linked data systems haven't like really succeeded in the large. And so we, we like have a very simple definition of what it means to be a data structure on IPFS. It's just a anything that you can convert into JSON. Uh, we don't we're not actually using JSON to store it but we're using that as like the format uh, that you can write to. So if you have a dictionary and you can label links and you can tell us what a link is, you've got yourself a Merkle tree and just take that data structure and ship it. And it is now interplanetary link data. You can take huge gobs of this and move it around. And so if, you, if you're building an application and you have a whole bunch of assets, you can just say, hey, bundle all of these assets. I, I probably didn't even publish most of them, but they're available somewhere in the network. I know that I'm going to put my application in a context where it's going to be offline, so just prefetch all of these, store them, and now carry them around. And you can even have signed content in there. You could have some of these nodes be content that's coming from some, some other service, but where instead of relying on a live connection, they're relying on signing the content. Um, 
And there's a whole bunch of standards for a lot of this already. This just kind of pieces it together uh, in, a, in a way that makes sense both with the transport, on the underlying transport, and with how you access the content on the web itself. Uh, so you'll see some cool stuff. So the IPFS stack uh, has a bunch of protocols, but you can use other stuff. Like you could actually use HTTP to move around the content. You can use BitTorrent. You could use uh, different kinds of routing systems. You could have like totally different um, tra uh, underlying transports. And the whole thing will still work, because we're layering, we're, we're thinking very carefully about how to layer all of this. And I won't, I won't speak very much about IPNS uh, here. It, it is a useful thing to think about. It's how we get mutability. Um, but if you think about um, SFS, like that was like the original introduction, I think, um, of this kind of naming where you name things by the hashes of public keys. And I think uh, GNS that uh, was talked about yesterday works this, uh, in a similar way. Um, cool. So the model of IPFS is very simple. You have programs, which are the IPFS nodes, that move around content, and they talk to each other somehow. You don't really care about it. Uh, and you have data, and that data is structured in this graph. And that's it. Um, the devil's in the details, of course, but uh, that's roughly the, the idea. And so the data looks like just um, a link table, which is what the links are, and the links are hashes of content, uh, and the data is anything you want. Uh, and you can resolve through this graph uh, I, I won't go too deeply into this because I don't want to bore you to death, but the general idea is you have a graph, you can look at links, the links are hashes, uh, Merkle tree, awesome. And you can represent anything uh, in this kind of system, like you can take Unix files and directories and structure it this way, you can take, like Git is already a graph like this, so we can import Git uh, just straight up, uh, we can import Bitcoin just straight up, we can use it to build arbitrary key value stores, we can do whatever we want. And to give you an example, if you wanted to take like, the Unix file system and structure it as a graph, files are nodes, big files can be split, directories are also nodes, and both, so directories link to files and files link to other chunks of themselves. And there you go, we have a DAG. We can now put it on IPFS and keep rolling. And uh, it's just how you translate between one system and another um, that matters. The IPFS node uh, just, from a basic sense, has a, a PKI-based identity, so every node has its own public private key pair. It connects with other nodes. It is meant to work over encrypted transport, so uh, they, like, it doesn't assume you have an encrypted transport, it just sets up one on, its, on, a, on, a, on itself. Um, and it can store uh, part of the, and each node stores parts of the DAG, and you get the DAG from other peers. The cool thing about IPFS nodes is that they're meant to be totally ubiquitous and heterogeneous. So you can have them be a server, so like you have a large machine that only has one IPFS node and that's it. Or you can have them be embedded in applications. So you can have many applications in your machine that have different IPFS nodes themselves and that coordinate differently how they talk to each other uh, and how they move around content. And uh, they just have these, there's like, you can think of the IPFS networks as huge overlay peer-to-peer -peer networks where any node may be able to dial every other node. You, you can't make that a guarantee because they could be disconnected or for security reasons you, you don't want that to happen. Um, but that's like the model. Cool, DHDs, we know about them. Uh, and then you move around data kind of like BitTorrent does. Uh, all right, that's the details. Mesh. Why does this ma matter when you think about mesh networks? Uh, so there's a whole bunch of problems, right? Uh, so I want to see time. I don't want to like uh, go over it too much. Um, when you think about like how um, mesh networks work, like work, you have this big network of routers, right? And so you have a whole bunch of, of hosts that can talk to each other and can send packets to each other and so on, and what I feel like most people in this room know is that if you start moving around a bunch of media, uh, you, you like saturate the, the pipe. If, you, if you're pulling down the media with like TCP from like a really far away link and you have many hops in the network, like you're, you're gonna be totally host. Um, and so that's not a pleasant experience, right? So what if you had like content caches in, in the middle of the network and you're able to decide how you uh, how you fetch that content from other peers. Uh, one of the fundamental problems with, with moving around content this way, like the reason it hasn't happened, is that the way 
HTTP content is structured is that you have to, by definition, talk to the source of the data to make sure that like, the data is, is, is the right data and that you get a URL that you resolve and you talk to the, uh, the other side. So if you break that apart and you say content can be anywhere, um, then you're free to, move, to design these kinds of networks where you have uh, hosts in the network that have content. Now, of course, this has a whole bunch of implica implications on security and anonymity, um, and I won't go too much into that today because I have before and it's recorded and so on. Uh, if you want to talk about that, we can, we can discuss. It usually boils down to the, the choices that you make in the, in the routing system. So IPFS is pluggable, and so you can decide what kind of routing system you use, and that can actually be a decision based on the content itself. So like you, you, the node can decide, an implementation of IPFS can say, oh, um, this content I'll route with you know, like the really fast uh, you know, DHT that's public and so on, and like I want to just get the content as fast as possible and bring it down. And this kind of content, uh, like, I don't want to do that because it's like my personal private files and I don't want to like just leak out what the blocks are, even if they're encrypted, like I, I just don't want random people to know that like those blocks are there. Um, and you can treat that very differently and think about trust networks there and move around content specific to specific other hosts. Uh, and so the part of the complexity of building uh, in, or designing the IPFS protocol is thinking about those policies and how you express those policies at the application level to make it make sense. Uh, but the whole point is, if you have a huge community mesh net and it's getting totally host all the time by peer-to-peer -peer or you know, like media uh, streams, why not think about having systems that cache a lot of content and have applications that move around that content that way uh, so you can fetch it from uh, where it makes sense to bring them. And this is not just for mesh networks, so it turns out that uh, companies like Netflix now uh, ship these huge machines uh, with like preloaded with tons of hard drives with, um, I think it's something like, actually they're not that big, I think they're only like 300 to 400 terabytes, but like they'll ship an ISP like this, this rack of hard drives preloaded with content and the ISP will just serve content from there. Uh, because they're getting hosed with the bandwidth, right? Like uh, companies like Netflix have to serve content all over the world and if you have a, a a group like that saying, okay, like, enough, like, let's just move the content where the users are, uh, then we, we know like, the network needs to change a little bit. Uh, and so uh, this is like not new, it's just how you make it available to web apps, that's the hard part, right? Like how do you structure the web application model in such a way that you don't have to change anything at the application layer, because like, or you know, very little, because you don't wanna force anyone to rewrite anything. Um, but you still get, a, get all of the power of these kinds of peer-to-peer -peer systems. So another example is like if you have a huge mesh, and of course the world works like this, there's a big cloud, and even if you want to talk between two hosts, you have to go dial out, and suddenly the cloud disappears or you know, shuts down for the day, and now you're all host. I feel like all of us experienced that in the last few days. Uh, when we couldn't download packages and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, cool, so the secret sauce of how you get a lot of this, one, like the only property you need is content addressing, which is what you get out of um, hashes, right? So if, if, you, if this didn't make obvious sense to you of how you would do this, uh, in the regular HTTP world, we address things by location, so we have IP addresses. Instead of that, let's address things by content, so you just hash it, and that's the definition of the of what the content means. And if you're given an identifier like that, then you, you can verify the content is correct. Uh, and very simply, you can apply encryption around the whole thing or encrypt blocks individually. And so you can still resolve everything. So you can have DAGs that are unencrypted and mean something and they're structured like IPFS objects and then encrypt the whole thing, which yields a new DAG, which you then can ship anywhere and pull back from anywhere. Uh, and then once you have it in, you dec decrypt it and you get another DAG. Does that kind of make sense? I don't want to like bore people with the details very much, but yeah, cool. All right, so instead of the world where like, you know, you can only talk to one machine and pull the content from there, anybody should be able to serve you stuff. Um, and this is particularly like a, a big deal in like mesh networks. So instead of like the old case where you're hosting the network, we want to get to something like this where uh, nodes in this room would immediately uh, distribute stuff to each other and would still work when you kill the connectivity to the, to the uplink. Um, 
Another case where mesh networks come in is like offline websites. So the, the current web of today only has uh, web servers, uh, web applications work as web servers. Uh, and that means that like, sorry, uh, it has like web apps, sorry, got distracted. Um, it has, the, the current model of the web has um, a structure where uh, web applications are programs running on web servers out in the backbone and web browsers and clients are in people's machines and they talk through the very slow ISPs all the way to the backbone and we have a word for that it's called molasses slow as molasses uh, so you know you have like this kind of operation going on in the network uh, so what if like you could have a different model where you dissociate the web application from the from the locations and you can move the applications into the network uh, into the local network and operate there uh, it turns out that like most websites you don't need to run like the amount of code today that runs entirely on the browser or where the operation doesn't need to be secured from like a client model, client server model, uh, and you can do most operations of a website entirely client side um, exists. So why not move as much as we can and move these applications uh, to, that, uh, to that area? This just means uh, practically just ship the JavaScript into the browser and operate it there. And so run a node in the browser itself. So either because your browser has implemented IPFS or because you implemented on the browser tab uh, through JavaScript that got included. So you don't, you don't need to install anything in the, in the browser. So we're getting to that. We're not fully there yet. Today, the implementations that we have, you have to install something. Uh, but we are getting to the point where like, you just ship a JavaScript file and you're good. So yeah, that's fun. Uh, how can you use IPFS today here? Uh, think about like all the package managers that you use and like packages that you download, OS images, uh, you know, all the conference and photos and videos that we're gonna make and take and so on, and all the storage that you're using. Like you can today use IPFS to like f fix these problems. Um, and to give you an example, uh, so I wanted to like actually dive into into the details of like using this. Um, let me get into like proper mode. Uh, so I have here like, I downloaded a whole bunch of um, images uh, of OpenWord and I have um, all of them here and like, that's about 800 megs. Yeah. So well, let me do that again. So I have a bunch of, whole bunch of images, right? And is that good enough or do you want a bigger? So that's like 800 megs, right? And we can just, I have this IPFS binary in my machine. And you know, it's like, cool, like a tool. Global peer-to-peer -peer Merkle DAG file system. Um, it has some commands. You can do things to data structures. You can operate with a network, um, and so on. Uh, let's just add that, all that content. So right now it's just like adding it to its own lo local repository. That looks nicer. There you go. Boop. It's hashing a lot of it. That's why it's going kind of slow. And cool. So I get some root. And so I can like ls that. And it's like, whoa, you ls that directory? Here you go. Here's like a huge uh, you know, listing of the same thing. And so here's every image with the hashes that represent that image and so on. And you're like, hey, like I want to, instead of looking at it on the, on the uh, command line, I want to look at it on the browser. Well, the distribution of IPFS that I have running here uh, happens to run a daemon. Um, I think right now it, it was like complaining about there not being peers, but I can, you can run IPFS by just typing IPFS daemon. And let me see if I'm connected to the network. Oh, I'm not. What uh, network are you guys using? Babel Extra, I'm guessing? Maybe? This one? The first one? I don't know. Do they all work? I don't know. <laughs> eh. hey, it's there. Uh, so the statement that I started, uh, what it did is that it opened some, um, it opened a, a couple of servers on uh, my TCP port 4001. It opened an, uh, an HTTP API, and it opened a gateway. And what the gateway is, it's like an HTTP to IPFS gateway, so we can do, localhost 8080 slash IPFS, 
and we paste that hash. And copy paste is like the hardest problem. Somehow we've made it difficult. Oh, that's not the right one. Oh, yeah, right. This one. So here we go. So we have like a full listing, like you know, traditional HTTP style. We have a whole like listing of the files. And we can click any of them and like it'll download it as you would from a web server, right? But this server is being this web server is really an IPFS node that I have running in my, my local machine. Uh, and if I want to visualize what this graph looks like, right? Like so let's let's take any one of these images and we have a tool called GraphMD, and what GraphMD does is that it pumps out like the definition of the graph uh, that that node represents. So we can like visualize the the uh, images. Uh, so here we go. We have an image where it's been chunked uh, with some chunker that we have. This one is using a, a very stupid thing. It's just like blocking things at certain intervals. Uh, we're implementing Rabin fingerprinting, uh, Rabin fingerprinting based chunking, which uh, is way better for DDoP. But even in this like totally brain dead damaged uh, chunking, you, we have an image where a whole bunch of the content uh, all linked, all got deduplicated. And why is that? Well, it turns out that that, if we look at it, can, can someone guess why that is? Mm. Well, so this is just one image. This is just one image. It's just zeros. So I can show you that. Uh, you can actually look at the, at the object. So it's just a whole bunch of zeros. And uh, it turns out that uh, when you create a, a, an image that is supposed to allo be allocated exactly to the size of the router, uh, the, of the router um, storage, then a lot of it will be zeros. So here we just deduplicated that content by just using the same structure. But then like, let's look at what, so instead of just looking at this one image, what if we look at the entire thing um, so we can look, look at this and then graph that. So this is a really big graph. So I'm going to like pipe it into dot, t, svg, <laughs> ropen. Doot. That'll take a bit because big graph. In fact, let's find out how, how big it is. I have a, a file here that has all the sizes. Um, wow, it's like taking a while. I wonder if that's dot or just pumping things out of the file system. Because it's right now fetching every single object and pulling it out to look at it for the, for the disk. Uh, to look at, it's grabbing uh, every single object from the repository, pulling it out, looking at the links, walking that graph and to generate the, the whole listing. There we go, it finished. So here we go. This is what all of the images for um, OpenWords uh, AR71XX uh, look like when they are deduped with like the totally brain damaged, like you know, specific size uh, uh, chunking. So we have some amount of reuse. Like here we have like two images that are like pointing at different segments. So they're kind of overlaid, right? So like this this one image at the top uh, points to some blocks over here, and then a whole bunch of the other ones are reused. Um, Pretty quickly, we get into graph hell, where like everything is just garbage that you're looking at. But you can see all these arrows coming from a whole bunch of places, right? That it's just getting like deduped. Um, ooh, that's crazy. Um, I like playing with all the software. This was written like what 70s, 80s. Um, so uh, let's find out what the size is. I think I had like a. Uh, there we go. So if I do. So I wrote a script that just uses IPFS, and like, let's look at that. Uh, all it's doing is a nice little bit, uh, some bash that it's using IPFS object stat, so you can stat the object to get its size. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's look at this hash. So I can stat the object to get its size. So I have 222 links. The block size is 24K, um, roughly. Uh, and we have like a cumulative size of like 800 megs, right? So cool, let's uh, do IPFS refs, which gives me, whoa, copy pasting. That gives me like all of the links that it's pointing to. 
And if I do dash r, it'll do it all recursively. And I just want the unique ones and pipe that into this block sizes thing. And that's going to like pull everything out again. I should have like just pre-cached these results. I have this like sizes thing. Couldn't figure out how to like just add these numbers up. Let's see if, if I'm faster. I'm sorry, but that's it. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So that's it. <laughs>